And we'll go very slowly today because I believe there's a lot in it. But of course, we won't go over 20 minutes. The book of Hebrews, the title is The, the Lordship of Christ Greater Than Moses. The book of Hebrews is uh, written by many people don't know there's an argument, debate who wrote the book. Some say Paul wrote it. I believe Paul wrote it because uh, the writing the style is exactly uh, the way Paul writes it, very similar to what Paul's writing. If you know a particular writer and if you read his books, you'll say, hey, it looks matches his time. Because, and to be honest, you, Paul was the only one who had the understanding of law, grace, you know, new covenant, old covenant in those days. He had that the depth of knowledge he had, we can see in the book of Hebrews. But anyway, there's, uh, the writer is unknown. I think it's Paul. Actually, I, I can see it's Paul anyway. Uh, what we are going to do is, in the book of Hebrews, in the beginning, what happened was, the, the, the reason for this book is, in those days, there are a lot of people who were, come from Judaism, who were Jews, following the law of Moses, the list of rules, you know, the, the, the old covenant of law. And those people believed in Jesus and they became followers of Christ. But there was such a persecution going on in those days. Uh, the persecution was so fierce that many of them decided, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth following Christ? Shall we just go back to our old uh, Judaism, old ways of living life where we follow Moses and, you know, the Mosaic law and all those things? So the writer of Hebrews here is trying to encourage them and say, hey, guys, what do you want to go back to? You know, do you want to go back to Moses? Hey, look here, we have something, someone better than him. So that's the argument here we are going to talk about. You know, he goes on to say, Jesus is greater than angels. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than the Aaronic priesthood. Jesus is greater. We have someone who is greater, who is someone who is better. And we have something here which is better. So there is nothing to go back to the old ways of the law. We have the new covenant of grace, the new newness of life where we live by the Holy Spirit. So the whole argument he's trying to encourage the people, don't go back, don't give up, stand fast in your faith, hold fast, move on, move forward in Christ. You know, there's much things here, there's much better things here. You know, Jesus is greater, he's better. So that's the whole argument Jesus is talking about. He's talking about. So what I'm going to pick up is the argument where Jesus is greater than Moses. The Lordship of Christ is greater than Moses. So we'll read from the uh, Hebrews chapter 3. We'll read the whole chapter, really, to be honest. With you. Or maybe a little of four. There's so much in it. Jesus greater than Moses. Now, who is Moses? Moses is a great man of God. He was a man who brought the law. You know, God gave the Ten Commandments. It was through Moses. He was the one, you know, who led the Israelites out of the, you know, out of Egypt. He walked through the Red Sea, through the dry land. So Moses was amazing man of God. You know, he spoke to God face to face. Anybody spoke to God face to face? God says about him in the Bible, where I speak to people through dreams, through visions, different ways. But this man, I speak to him face to face. This is what God speaks about Moses. So Moses is, is a great man of God, a great prophet of God. And the Jews held Moses highly. They regarded him very highly, you know. So he had a special place in their hearts, you know. Then we go on to see in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 3, we'll start reading from verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, okay, listen, this is the argument between Jesus and Moses. Okay, who is greater? So this is what the writer is trying to uh, argue with the people who want to go back to Judaism. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. Consider Jesus, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all the house. Moses was faithful. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, in so much as, the, as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, 
if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. You know, then he goes on to say, therefore, if you hear his voice today, if you hear the Holy Spirit today, do not harden your hearts, you know, as it did in the, in the days of provocation in the wilderness. So anyway, he's saying we have somebody who is greater than Moses. Yes, Moses is great. He's faithful. He was faithful in the house of God. But we have someone here who is the Lord of the house, who owns the house, who has built the house. You know, where are you going back to Moses? You know, we have Jesus here. So that's the argument. He was faithful in the house. So who is greater? The house is greater? Or somebody who builds the house is greater? The one who builds the house is greater. Moses was a servant, faithful servant. But Jesus is a faithful son. That's the difference. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given, grace came. That's the difference there. The law was given, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the law represents Moses. Moses represents the law. You know, Moses represents the law. And Jesus represents the new covenant, the grace of God. You know, Paul preached the gospel. He said the gospel of the grace of God. So there are two things. The Old Testament, new covenant, old covenant of the law, which represents Moses. And the New Testament, new covenant, the covenants have changed now. We are not under the old, we are under the new. The Romans, if you read the book of Romans, Corinthians, you see it very clearly. We are not under the old, we are under the new. You know, Paul goes on to say, we are dead to the law. We are dead to Moses. That was one of the reasons why Paul was the most persecuted person in history. The reason was people misunderstood him, that he's speaking against Moses. And that's why the Jewish, Jewish people didn't like him. They wanted to kill him. But he was not speaking against Moses. He was saying, your Moses is a servant, Jesus' son. So this argument is not here from Hebrews. If you read the letters of Paul, it's been going on from before, the law and grace, law and grace. It's a, it's a very touchy subject. <laughs> it's a very touchy subject. Many people get really upset about it. But the truth is, Jesus is grace, the grace of God. God has made you, given you the grace of God. We all are saved by grace, not by the law. Law didn't save us. The law shows you your sins. The law points your sins, says you are a sinner, you are a liar, you are a thief, you are an adulterer, you are this, you are that. It All it does is say, says to you, this is who you are and you need a savior. I'm making, making any sense. The Bible says the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So once the law has bring it, shown you how bad you are, you know, you need a savior. Now you've got the savior. You don't need the schoolmaster anymore. The, the whole purpose of the schoolmaster bring you to Christ. You have Christ. You don't need him anymore. I'm making any sense here. But sometimes people like to hold on to the law because the old ways of living, old style, you know. Because what happens is law is good. There's nothing wrong with the law. Law is holy, you know, law is good, law is holy. But the problem is God found fault with the law. If you read in uh, Hebrews later on, it says, God actually found fault with the law. That's why he has to establish another covenant. You know, in the old covenant of law, it says, thou shall not do this, thou shall not do that. Remember the old covenant written on stone? It says, thou shall not do this, thou shall not do this, thou shall. It's all you. But the new covenant of grace where God says, I will remember your sins and iniquities no more. It's me. It's not you anymore. It's Christ. It's God will do it. It's not you who are doing it. What did we do get, get saved anyway in the first place? Nothing. We believed. So that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Just believe. Hold on to your faith. Don't go back to the works of the law, to the works mentality. You know, don't go back to that. You're free from that. You died to sin. You died to the law. You know, law shows you sin. He makes us, the Lord gives you, makes us sin conscious. But Christ, we should be conscious about Christ, not the law. Because law, just for example, if I say to you, you should not do this. And you have that in your mind. I'll say, for example, this is an example. Now, all of you look at me. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. You shall not think about a red elephant. Don't think about a red, a red elephant. Oh, don't think about a red elephant, a red, a red color elephant, okay? Red elephant, don't think about a red elephant. Now, how many of you thought about a red elephant? Actually, visualize picture. 
That's what the law does. It makes you sin conscious. But grace makes you Christ conscious. So that's the difference between law and grace. We won't go more deep in that because there's, there's a lot more. And I don't want to start <laughs> opening up the thing. Uh, so the so writer here is trying to say we have somebody here who is better than Moses. We have Jesus here. You don't need Moses anymore. You got Jesus. Christ is enough. Jesus Christ, Moses didn't die for us on the cross. Jesus did. Moses wore a veil. Remember? But Jesus tore the veil. And he made a way for all of us. The voice of God was so scary and fearful. The people didn't want it to go and you know, close it to God or hear the voice of God. They said, Moses, you go and talk to God. But now, when the veil has been parted in two, we all have the, the, the access to the throne of God. We all have the access to, through God, through the blood of Christ. It's no longer he is bigger, that is bigger. No, we all are same. Everybody are priests and you know, righteous people of God. You know, law didn't make us righteous. It showed us our sin, but Christ made us righteous. You know, by one offering, you know, it says in uh, uh, Romans 5, 17, actually I'll read it to you. It's very interesting, actually, very good. Where is Romans 5, 17? It says, for if by one man's offense, death reigned through one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. It says by one man's offense, Adam, by his one man's offense, all were made sinners. So we were born sinners. But with one man's obedience, all were made righteous. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? So now when you get up in the morning, you're not a sinner anymore. You are a righteous person of God. Righteousness means you're in absolute standing, right standing with God. There is nothing you have to do to come more closer to God. There is nothing you have to do for God to love you more. There is nothing you have to do to be accepted by God because Jesus has done it all. And he said it is finished. All you have to do is believe it and access through your faith. But unbelieving, there is a, then later on Hebrews says about the rest of God. Many people can't enter that rest because of unbelief. He says, today you will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as you did in the day of provocation in the wilderness, where they did not believe. The Jews who were led by Moses out of Egypt had a promise from God about entering the promised land. They had a promise that God will lead them to a promised land. He will give them a land flowing with milk and honey. That was a promise, and they were believing that, but most of them didn't believe it. They, said, they started murmuring and complaining and grumbling. And because of that, the journey from Egypt to the promised land is around 11 days, under two weeks. It took them 40 years. God did allow them to go in there because of unbelief. Because of unbelief, they didn't, more, many of them didn't enter the promised land. It was after 40 years where Joshua led them. If God didn't even allow Moses to enter the promised land, Moses died in the wilderness. Why did Moses die? Many people have different reasons, but I think this is what I saw a few years ago. Moses represents the law. You know, the new promised land represents the new covenant of grace. God doesn't want the law and grace being mixed together. He wants the law separate and grace separate because you can't mix the both. New wine should be put into new wine skins, otherwise they will burst. And you know, you know that word. So that's how it is. So we have to live by believing that Jesus died. For the Jewish people, the promised land was there, but they didn't believe. They hardened their hearts and did not enter in. But what is the promised land for us today? Heaven. We believe in Jesus, and yes, our names are written in heaven. But how can we bring it to a day to day? Like every day today, day to day. How can we practice that today? It says in Hebrews, if you later on read it at home, it says in Hebrews, it says it goes on to say about the rest of God. That there is there therefore remaineth a rest for the people of God. 
And those who believe by, you know, by, by faith, you enter the rest of God. You know, you don't enter in by striving and you know, trying to do by your works, you know, trying to follow a list of rules or trying to live by the law of Moses. All those things, you know, Jesus fulfilled at the cross. All you have to do is just believe it and you enter in. Those people in the Old Covenant, Old Testament, couldn't enter in. You know, the high priest, the high priest represents, I'll say something, share with you something. The high priest in the Old Testament, he represents, he represented the people of God to God. Okay? Now, if the high, so they have to take offering to sacrifice, you know, behind the veil, and they had to tie a rope to his leg, the chains, you know, the, and if the high priest is accepted before God, God will bless Israel that year. That year there will be rain, there will be good fruit, the land will flourish, you know, every, blessings will flow. And if the high priest is not accepted, the high priest dies in his face. So they have to pull him out of the way, you know, of the Holy of Holies, pull him out. If the high priest, what I'm trying to say is the high priest is accepted, you are accepted. If the high priest is rejected, you are rejected. That's how it was in the old covenant. God did not bless people because the high priest was rejected. God blessed them because the high priest was accepted. God didn't look at the people. God saw the high priest. The high priest represented people, Jewish people before God. But now, who is our high priest? Jesus. Is he accepted before God? Yes. Are you accepted before God? Yes. Why are you accepted? Be because your high priest is accepted. It's not you anymore. It's Jesus. Jesus is accepted. Jesus is accepted. And you are accepted. You know, John says that we may have boldness at the, at the day of judgment, because as Jesus is, John 1, John 4, 17 says, as Jesus is, so are you in this world. So as Jesus is, so are you in this world. When you woke up this morning without you praying, without you reading, without you doing any kind of, you know, godly things or spiritual activities, you were righteous. God, you are loved by God. You are accepted. There is nothing you can do to get more accepted by God. You are accepted. You are loved. You know, imagine how much worth, you know, how much importance it is to know that God loves you. There's so many people trying to live by rules, legalism, you know, trying to do everything to be accepted and loved by God. You know, and they get frustrated and say, I can't do it anymore. You know, it's too hard. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So it's time that we come to Jesus. It's time that we lay down trying to please God. Just believe, enter in that rest of God by believing that God is already well pleased with me. You know, He's not just pleased, He's well pleased with you. Not because you have done something, it's because Jesus has done what Jesus has done on the cross. And He said, It is finished. There is nothing left for you to do. He finished it all. All you have to do is believe. And enter in, enter the rest of God by believing. It says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as the day, the day of provocation. They, because they couldn't enter in because of unbelief. All we have to do is believe that there is a rest. I can enter that rest by believing in God, by believing in Jesus. And enjoy my relationship with him every day. Even when I make mistakes, fail and fall, God is not going to throw me out. He still loves me because I never got saved by my works. I got saved by faith, by grace through faith. In the same way, you know, when I make mistakes, I'm still loved by God. I'm still accepted by God, you know. So the covenant has changed. The contract has changed. The old covenant under the law of Moses, you have to do it to be blessed by God. If you fail to do it, there's a curse. But under here, if you do it, God blesses you. If you don't do it, if you fail to do it, God still blesses you. Because it's not you. It's Christ and him crucified on the cross. It is finished. So, I'll also just before, before I end this, I just want to say this. On a day-to-day -day basis, as it is very important for us to enter this rest of God. You know, in the Bible, you know, some, I heard somebody said, in the Bible it says that 365 times it's been said, fear not, fear not, fear not. You know? But here in, here in Hebrews chapter 4, uh, chapter, if you read Hebrews chapter, he says, fear therefore, 
to enter the rest of God. That is one thing you have to fear. It says, labor therefore to enter the rest of God. There is one thing you have to labor now to enter that rest. Not to do something to please God, but just rest with knowing that I'm loved by God. I'm accepted of God the way I am. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. What a great gospel we have. What a great Jesus we have. Any other religion preaches this? No. It's so easy. Only believe. Only believe. And by believing, we enter the rest of God. So labor, therefore. It's a daily thing. Sometimes you, you can get up thinking that I have to do this. I have to do that every morning. And then, you know, there is, we put a place, a, a thing of, like a demand is there upon our lives. I have to do this. It's like we live that, you know, by a list of rules. Uh, there's some kind of demand over that. And what we have done is we have put ourselves under the uh, law. And then what happens is we get stressed out. When we enter the rest, the stress goes. But if we don't enter the rest, we get stressed. And everything we are doing on a daily basis is out of that stress because we are not entering that rest. But the day, by the time when we enter the rest, whatever we do is out of the rest. You know, we may have children, family, everybody. It has to be through rest. So enjoy the rest of God. Labor to enter the rest of God. Amen. God bless you. Yes. I think that was amazing, wasn't it? I mean, this is the gospel. This is the, the why we're here. And it's just an opportunity. Um, there are people here who have yet to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. And this is your day of salvation. And this is your opportunity to say yes to Jesus, uh, to say, I've been struggling under my own strength. I've tried to be religious. I tried to follow this book and it's too difficult for me. Of course it is. It's too difficult for anyone. But by the grace of God, Jesus came to take your place on that cross, shed his blood so that you can live and live forever. And um, this is your day where you can come to Jesus. So number one, if you've not yet given your life to Jesus, you can today. This is an opportunity. Uh, number two, there are a few people here who, despite having received Jesus, are following this kind of legalism, this kind of like, I'm, all, I'm always getting it wrong. I'm a failure. I try, I try, I try, and I'm always falling down. That's a very unhelpful, unhealthy way of of leading the Christian life. And if you find that you're going round in that circle or round in that spiral, today is an opportunity to be released yeah, from man. that yeah, yeah. and to enter into this gracious, resting uh, enjoyment of God um, where, yes, you're a sinner, but you're a saved sinner and you just enjoy the fact that Jesus is with you and helping you grow in your life. So let's come to Jesus for whatever reason. It's because, yeah, I, I, I realize now the penny's dropped. Jesus died for me. I really want that salvation and that eternal life. Or I haven't quite fully understood my faith. I've been trying under my own strength and it's not working. Again, come to Jesus. We've got space here. We've got time. We've got people who can pray with you. Just be brave and come. You're welcome. Yeah. I think we all have somewhere allowed legalism in our lives. Mm -hmm. And we have followed the list of rules on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. You know, today is the day where we decide now it is finished. The cross has done it all. Do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts. Made them go all soft and gooey. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter if you're um, uh, old or young or anywhere in between. You're welcome mm -hmm. to come.